Hey, my name is Joel. A few months ago, I did a video on tuning a bass drum the way I like to tune bass drums, uh, specifically with the microphones in mind. In my case, I use two microphones every time I either record or play live. I use one microphone internally to capture the attack of the batter head and one mic in front of the resonant head to capture the body and the sustain and the tone of the drum. And the sound that I go for typically, if I have my choice, is one that has nice articulate attack and has this sort of late bloom after the attack that I exaggerate with some processing. And to accompany that video, I did another video on my recording channel to show how I process those microphones to get the final sound that I was going for. And I will link to both of those videos below so you can check them out. This is sort of a part two to that. And the reason that I'm doing the part two is because after I released the video, I got some comments from people saying, how would you do a 22 inch drum? Because that video I used my 24 inch Ludwig, which is my favorite drum for that type of sound. That video really was about not so much generic bass drum tuning as tuning a specific type of sound that I really, really enjoy and how I achieve that with the use of the tuning for the two microphones. And I use that drum because that drum sounds great for that type of sound. But I mentioned in the video that because it's 24 inches, 24 inch drums require a little bit more um, finesse and a little bit more attention to detail to get them dialed in right. There's more real estate on a 24 inch head than there is on say a 22 inch or a 20 inch head. It's not just a difference in linear inches, 22 versus 24 being two inches more, not a big deal. Actually, from a surface area perspective, it's a pretty substantive difference and you're going to need to use more tension on a larger head to get the same effect. And so I made the comment in the video that um, something to the effect of 22 inch drums are easier to tune or something like that. And so several people said, well, what would you do for a 22 inch drum? And as I thought about it, I realized that 22 inch is probably the standard, if there is one, bass drum size of the universe, right? I mean, it's probably the most common size and therefore, Maybe I should have used a 22 inch drum for that video. And another thing I realized since making that video is that not everybody uses two microphones for bass drums. Either they don't have the luxury of doing it and that they don't have enough microphones to dedicate two of them just to the bass drum. Or quite frankly, some people just don't want to mess with it. They want a simpler approach. Just get the drum tuned, put the mic where you want it, moving on. And I did nothing to really sort of service, if you will, anybody who is interested in just using one microphone. So I've decided to make a new video to expand on that. And I'm going to use this here bass drum, which is a 22 by 14 Tama Royal Star bass drum from about 1982 or 83. This, for people who are geeky enough to know much about Tama Royal Star bass drums, this is the first generation Brazilian grain. They did make a second. And for people who know Royal Star in general, you probably think of it as an entry-level drum. This one actually is not. It's actually a fully professional drum. In fact, the shell is really an actual Tama Imperial Star shell of the time. But it's the only 9-ply Luan shell that Tama made that was not wrapped in plastic. This thing instead was sprayed with a faux rosewood stain and printed with a faux grain. So this grain that you see is not actually part of the wood. It's actually printed on the shell, which I actually think is rather cool. Anyway, it's fodder for another video for another time. Um, I think Royal Star is a largely misunderstood line from Tama. I think even Tama throughout the years didn't quite know what to do with it. So its uh, quality varies, but this is one of the good ones. Anyway, it's the drum I'm using. It's 22 by 14 inches, so it will work really well. Now the heads I'm using... On the batter, I am using an Aquarian Response 2 coated. This is a two-ply head. Both plies are seven mil thick, and it's coated. I like the coating because it gives a little extra warmth, and I like two-ply heads on bass drums. I'm not a giant fan of pre-muffled bass drum heads, primarily because they produce a sound, and they're not very versatile to produce other sounds. Whereas if you just have a good single-ply or dual-ply head, I like two ply heads on bass drum batters, then you can get as resonant or as muffled a tone as you want, depending upon how you muffle it. So food for thought. Um, and then the front head here is, I don't know what its providence is, but it says Tama on the front, but it feels like a 10 mil single ply head. 
It is a single ply medium white, smooth white head. And did I say it says Tama on the front of it? Yeah. So anyway, I actually used an Aquarian, um, you know, a little cutout uh, stencil or whatever for the port and cut a hole in the thing so I can access it with a microphone. And the drum sounds good with this head combination. So that's what I use. Okay. So to get started with this thing, I have all of these. T-Rods, that's old enough to have T-Rods, not Key-Rods, have all the T-Rods completely loose, so you can hear them rattling on the drum. So to start with, I'm just going to go finger tight, and finger tight to me, when you have T-Rods, really just means the point at which the claws are not rattling around. So I just kind of tighten them and turn them to the point where they're not rattling loose on the hoop anymore. Now you can hear the claws and T-Rods rattling on the front side. This is the back side batter. Okay, so when I get it basically snug, that's my starting point. And you can tell it's very dead. Now, that's not a horrible sound if you want like a disco thing. You're going to stick a pillow in it, particularly if you're going to do one head. Um, that can actually get a surprising sound. I actually want some tone off the back of the drum. Now, I don't want you to just do what I do. Because you may have a different head on your bass drum, and that different head is going to respond differently. I've seen lots of videos where people say, oh, well, you know, just tune it up to where the wrinkle is just almost disappears or, you know, they have some sort of a, um, a standard thing where you don't have to use your ears, you can just use your eyes and you can just tune the drum a certain number of turns or whatever and, you know, and now you've got the ideal bass drum sound. One size does not fit all. I really would encourage you to learn to use your ears and, and recognize the sound that you're getting from the drum and then in time recognize how the microphone perceives that too because the, the other video I was talking about tuning for the microphones because the microphones ultimately are going to capture the drum what they hear and how they present that back on the recording is really what matters what's happening in the room doesn't really matter what the microphones hear that's what matters and so in time you'll start to realize how microphones interpret the sound of drums because it is different again another rather extensive topic for another video series or whatever but this is a very dead sound and what i want to hear from this is a little bit of sustain, a little bit of tone. It's not gonna to take too much because I want the sound to be low. So I'm going about a quarter of a turn, maybe about an eighth to a quarter of a turn on these uh, T-Rods. And it's starting to have a little bit of tone. So I'm just gonna go just a fraction up on all of them again. Going around the edge, you can tell where there's absolutely no tension. By the way, just for what it's worth, I usually do finger tight. You know, if you saw my snare drum video, I haven't done one on toms yet, but it's the same thing. I'll go finger tight on the drum, and then I want all the key rods as I'm working to have the same pitch as I bring the drum up or, you know, down or whatever I do with it. I want to match the tension and the, and the pitch at each of the key rods that's not really true for the bass drum primarily because your pedals bolted to this thing and the beaters hit in the exact same spot every single time the problem with different tension on a typical drum one that you're playing with your stick snare drum or toms or whatever is that if, you know if you look at a dirty used drum head you can see it's just been struck all over the place if you look at a bass drum head that's been used you'll have a divot or a dent in one spot because it hits the same spot every single time. So if the drum sounds good in one spot, it sounds good, right? Or two spots in the case of a double, you know, double pedal. Um, so it's a little bit different. I don't really get too wound up about making sure all of them are nice and even. Another reason is because if everything is all nice and even, you're more likely to have a singular pitch or a stronger fundamental pitch to the drum. And when it comes to bass drums, which I typically myself like to be resonant, I don't really automatically go for a dead or a muffled sound that's just a thump. I like some tone and some boom and some sustain. For that reason, I don't 
like to bring all of the key rods into absolute pitch because then you wind up having a more defined pitch from the drum and I find that that doesn't really help a lot of mixes. Uh, it's nice to have some weight and some low frequency, you know, boom or sustain or whatever, but it's not like an 808 where you've got a pitch, you know, that you necessarily may want a pitch. I just want sort of low frequencies in general. So again, I'm not too worried about trying to get these all matched, but I do want them all to produce a little bit of tone. Okay, and I'm gonna go up just a skosh further. Okay, so that's just a little bit of sustain, not much. I'm gonna get more sustain from the front head. So let's work on the front head. Same thing, starting point, just getting the claws to not move around on the hoop. And just like that, the drum is quiet. And I'm feeling Get them tight enough that wiggling them doesn't move them. And of course, as I bring them all into higher tension, it kind of loosens it up for all the others. What was snug is not as snug as I bring more into tension. Okay, so I get them all to where they're... All right, so that's a good starting point. Now check this out. You hear the sustain from that? That I didn't get from the backside? Two reasons. One, mass, greater mass with the two plies on the back, and also friction. You've got two plies that are vibrating against each other, and that friction between those two plies stops the vibration of the head. So for that reason, and that's another reason why I like the simple, like just tune it, look at the wrinkles and tune according to the wrinkles. It doesn't work for everything because I have no tension really on this head. I've just brought the claws where they're not rattling anymore. And I've already got more sustain on this single ply 10 mil, pretty sure this is a 10 mil head. And you can also tell there's really no pitch to that, it's just rumble. Okay, so I like that, but for safety's sake, I don't want these things loosening a little bit under playing and start rattling and making noise. So I'm gonna take them up just a little, not much. Don't really want to change the pitch of the head. I will be changing it a little bit, but I don't really want to do much to it. And that extra tension does increase the sustain a little bit. That's what I want from this drum. Okay, so now if I look, what's moving here? Oh, it's the, I heard some rattling and it's the uh, hardware that holds the spurs on, so. Tighten that up a little. Okay, so. So I've got some, that's just a little, little easy for you to say. I've got some sustain on the back and more on the front. And you can tell how not tuned that is. That is low frequency rumble. Now that is critical because that's what's going to change between the two miking situation and the single miking situation. So I'm gonna put one mic inside the drum as I did in the other video to capture the attack. And the inside of the drum will be almost all attack. It's not gonna have much low end really to speak of at all, primarily because there's almost no tension at all on the front head. And that works great when there's a microphone on the outside right up by the head to pick up all that low frequency rumble, which is gonna stay because I'm not gonna muffle it too much. And so I'm gonna pick up all of that and then I can process that and do what I want with it. The microphone on the inside is not gonna hear a lot of low end because of that. It doesn't create much tone inside the drum and you'll see what I mean when I do the audio examples. And so I will tell you up front what I'm gonna do. First, I'm gonna record this. I'm gonna put a pillow in it though. What kind of pillow am I gonna use? Where's my pillow? I'm going to put a pillow in it and put this thing in it. I like this kind of pillow because it's not very heavy, but laid out. I think it's supposed to go against like the batter head and it's got this Velcro, which I really don't like sticking 
taping Velcro to the inside of the shell. And I just don't like taping things to the shell. I don't know why. But I like laying this out because laid out length to length, it's, it pretty much touches both heads. With the backside getting more contact than the front, which is appropriate. I don't really want much resonance from the backside. The front, just touching it, is just barely going to mute this front head a little bit. And that's really perfect. The other benefit to this is that most drums on the inside that are quality drums, and this is, um, are lacquered or not lacquered. They're sealed. The wood is not raw. There's actually a coating of some kind on the wood, which creates a harder, more reflective surface. So the high frequencies get to bounce around a little bit more. And sometimes that can be overbearing. And so having a soft material laying inside the drum, whether or not it's touching the heads, it's kind of not the point, but having the soft material in the drums gives a place for those high frequencies to go. And so it, it tames the high frequency response of the drum so that you get more defined attack without any kind of weird basketball-like effect or whatever. Uh, and then the little bit of pressure against the front and more against the back side or the batter head really gets this kind of sound that I want from the drum for the microphones. So I'm going to go ahead and put this thing in here and I'm going to record this drum. So the audio that you're going to hear in this is first and foremost going to be this drum tuned with the same approach that I tuned that drum in the previous video. Uh, two microphones, one capturing the attack and one capturing the boom. And then I'm going to play that audio again, going back and forth between the two microphones, processed the way that they are so that you can hear the sound I'm getting from the internal mic and the sound that I'm getting from the external mic that then combine to create the final sound. Then you're going to hear that audio again, but only the internal mic process that's in an effort to kind of optimize the sound of the bass drum with just the one microphone. And I think you'll see that the low end, even though it's enhanced with EQ, I didn't go crazy with it because it starts to sound weird, but try to get a somewhat natural, solid sound from that microphone. And you can see how deficient that is when it comes to low end because there's no tension on the front head. So to increase the tension on the front head, I'm going to turn each of these pretty much exactly one quarter turn, more or less, all the way, all the way around. And then I will play again and you'll see that that drum has a lot more tone because of the higher tension on the front head. But I like very, very low frequency, low, low thump. And by tuning all of them up a little bit, you wind up getting a nice bit of tone, but it sort of raises the pitch in my opinion, a little too much on a 22 inch drum. So to compensate for that and to get rid of the sense of pitch that it can start to take on, I'm gonna detune two adjacent lugs as far as I can without the claws rattling on the hoop. And by having that lack of tension on those two adjacent lugs while keeping the higher tension on all of the other ones, You'll see that the pitch drops back down. It also stifles the front head's ability to resonate. So the sound's going to be a shorter sound, a more punctual sound, and a deeper tone. Yet it will still have lots of tone that the original very loose tuning did not have from the perspective of the internal mic. And hopefully those examples will kind of demonstrate for you, you know, some techniques that you can use when you're tuning your bass drum with one or two microphones to get the sounds that you want. So... Check out these samples.
know, Bob, compared to the sound of the two mics in the previous clips, that kick sound was a little on the wimpy side, if you ask me. Definitely leaves something to be desired in the low end. Well, Tom, Joel did say that a low-pitched resonant head means not much tone happening inside the drum. I see that he's now raising the tension on that front head by, what, a quarter turn per lug? Indeed, Bob. I understand that was part of his pregame strategy for increasing the amount of tone inside the drum. I wonder what effect it'll actually have. Well, Tom, let's see if that little adjustment can bring him some of the tone he's missing. Seems like a definite improvement, Bob. A definite improvement, Bob, indeed, Tom. But now it seems the overall tone of the drum is a bit higher than the deep lows we generally like in a bass drum. Wait, now he appears to be dropping the tension on two, yes, two adjacent lugs, about as far as he can without allowing the claws to rattle. It's a good strategy, Bob. Dropping the tension on those two lugs lowers the drum's pitch and makes it more punctual while providing plenty of tone inside the drum. And inside the drum is what matters, Tom. He's using only a single mic, after all, and it's just inside the front head. Let's hear what happens. That's pretty interesting stuff, isn't it? You can see how dramatically small adjustments really affect the sound of the drum. And that's, again, why I don't love these oversimplified, you know, just get it to where it's, you know, just not wrinkled or it's just barely wrinkled or all these little things that everyone tells you that works. One size does not fit all. You really do have to listen. But it's not total rocket science. It's a little bit of art involved, but really... It makes sense, and frankly, what I just showed you, some variation of that is pretty much going to get you where you want to go 90, 95% of the time. You're not usually going to have to stray from that very much. So as always, I hope that is useful to you. I appreciate you watching, and I will see you again next time, hopefully. Thanks. Bye.